I've been wanting to look at Team 6 games since, well, since this channel started, really. My third video on this channel was actually a review of a Team 6 game. The review was hilariously poor, and it was made to prove that 14 year old me really was funny. He wasn't. How stupid! I even wrote another review, but I gave up with the script after barely getting through the game's introduction. But I feel like now, despite the fact that I'm still not very good at reviewing games, I feel ready to tackle just some of the games in Team 6's catalogue. Here are some of the things I want to say before starting. Firstly, I won't be reviewing every single game, as most games repeat themselves in terms of maps, gameplay, or both. Alright, move that out of the way, let's begin. The first ever game that Team 6 had produced was... Oh god, I didn't expect such a simple statement to be this confusing. Alright, let's start from the beginning. While Team 6 was founded in 2003, the company was actually making games for a German contractor, Blimb Entertainment. On their website, we can see a cropped in screenshot of the development tool for the engine. Pretty cool! What wasn't cool was Blimp ripping off the developers, as Blimp did not give the devs insight into sales or royalties. Which to me sounds like the team that became Team 6 either was making games for free, or they weren't getting the money they deserved from their games. So therefore they left, and formed Team 6. A sad story really, because in the interview they did sound really upset by it, and even say that they understand why Steam is picking up. Steam. This is in 2005 by the way, way before Steam was as popular as it is now. There are various games that were released on the Team 6 that were originally released by Blimp, like Taxi Racer London 2, also known as Taxi Challenge London, Taxi Madness London, Taxi Racer in London, and London Taxi, one of the games we'll be looking at later on, and arguably one of the most popular games from this era. The first game was actually Taxi Challenge Berlin, also known as Berlin Taxi, which shares many of the same assets as Taxi Racer London 2, and are essentially the same games, minus different car models and a different city. And even then, the city feels very similar gameplay-wise. There was also Taxi Challenge New York, also known as Taxi Racer New York 2, Taxi Racer New York, and New York Taxi. Which, while I won't be looking at it, for now, the map feels fresher and more different to that of the Berlin and London one. You see, just like the London Racer series of games, these games are all the same gameplay-wise, but just have different maps and cars. After Team 6 form, they re-released their games, which is why they had the number 2. They're not sequels, since they're identical games, but the original games didn't hold the same names, so why even bother with the number 2, it's just confusing. What I do know is that after Team 6 re-released their games, they partnered with Dablex, who, as we know from Dablex Overflow, recently stopped game development to focus on being a publisher. Team 6 had made two games for Dablex, Amsterdam Taxi Madness and Taxi Raza. Like the A2 series and Audubon Raza series, these games were primarily made with Netherlands and Germany in mind, respectively. So now with the history segment out of the way, Let's tackle the New York slash Berlin slash London series of taxi games by playing Taxi Racer London 2. As you can see on the display screenshots, the game is visually outstanding. Can I point out the fact that this release of the game is from 2007? This is not visually outstanding. Once we boom through the game, the first thing that stands out, other than the music, we'll get onto that later, is the hilariously bad menu system, particularly in terms of the translation. Look, I know this game was made in the early 2000s and the devs are Dutch. I'm not poking fun at them for not being able to spell English, even if English is one of the spoken languages in the Netherlands. But the spelling of these words are just really funny. They're like this mix of Dutch and English, Dutchlish, if you will. And one of the keys doesn't even have a name. What am I changing here? This will either come as no surprise, or it'll blow your mind, but Team 6 was in fact a team of 6 developers. I know that I haven't even started to speak about the gameplay, but I think it's a nice prelude to keep in mind that this is essentially the 2000s equivalent of indie devs. And while nowadays we have engines like Unity and Unreal, as well as custom shaders, purchasable assets and music, none of that really existed back then. From top to bottom, everything you see here was made by scratch by 6 developers only. But alright, let's get into the gameplay now. If you play Crazy Taxi, or in fact have ever gone into a taxi, you'll understand the game. You need to find a customer and drive them to the location. They will have a dollar sign over their head to signify how much they'll pay, depending on how far they want to go. You will want to pick up orange or red customers in the beginning and go for green towards the end of the clock. That counts down every level. Unlike Crazy Taxi, there is a set amount of... Christ, dollars? Euros? Well, certainly not pounds. They have to collect each level to pass, as this is not an arcade racer, so a progression system needs to exist. You have a variety of characters to choose from, all with different cars that handle slightly differently. You'll notice that one of the cars we can choose is a Koenigsegg. Ken 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 Blim was <laughs> Blim supposedly had a license for the car and was going to use the license on a game that never came out. However, Team Six very likely did not have a license to use the car's name. So yeah, oops. 
In fact, did you know that a blimp version of this game actually featured Kenex Zed predominantly, and even featured an advertisement for the company at Piccadilly Circus? Also, the characters' names were different in the original blimp version, interestingly enough. There are also power-ups that I have to pick up, my favourite being the jump and speed boost. They're always in the same location, if you want to learn their location to help you with the later stages. Although, frankly, I'm not sure how much the power-ups help, since they're so wacky that they just mess you up half the time. Let's talk about the location. The devs being Dutch and not made of money, likely used the internet, books and maps as sources for creating the game's world, as opposed to being there in person and taking extensive research, like the getaway. So what is done according to the Dutch? Show me what you're made of, sweetheart. It's clear. Hurry up, hurry up, got to go shopping. <laughs> shopping, here I come. Go, go, in hurry. Hurry, hurry, it's birthday of my child. Thank you, be driving with you again. Ouch. The voice acting has to be the worst offender here, as funny as some of the lines are, it all feels a bit xenophobic. I mean, the billboard doesn't help either, but yeah. Regardless, the voice acting isn't great, and there are a variety of voices here, so you end up hearing the same people de delivering different lines. It all gets very old very quickly. But the map itself is pretty great in my opinion. I've only been to London a handful of times, so I don't really know it very well, but all the main attractions are here, even if they don't make sense location-wise sometimes. Especially Piccadilly Circus, this doesn't look like Piccadilly Circus at all. I think even the underground is vaguely in the right spots. The map is definitely the best thing about this game, as it's not carefully crafted like London Racer 2, but it's large for the time and for the budget, and there's a lot of variety in the types of buildings. There are even little easter eggs scattered around throughout the entire game, going that extra mile that I did not need to. I love the fake companies that I include in the game. Toilet McDonald's is pretty funny, same with Fujifilm. There's even a bootleg Lara Croft, and beside her a real IMAX ad, curiously enough. The game's art styles follow realistic, which quite a lot of games used in the early 90s and early 2000s. It aged so badly and I love it so much. Because you know, can't get more realistic than real photographs of stars. Hey look, there's even a Disney star. The world really does feel DIY handcrafted. Like, it's polished and detailed, but it's also quite the opposite. Feeling large and empty. It's weird, and I don't even know if that makes sense. What also gives off this DIY aspect are the models of themselves. The houses don't have any sort of bump maps or anything really. They feel like the pictures of houses printed on cardboard. And this is even more true of the smaller models like the ducks, pets and guards, which look like they've been chiseled out of wood. The music in this game is so weird. Inside the game, the music furthers the overall crust feeling. Like think about Crazy Taxi, the game is fun because of the upbeat rock music. Here it's this. That's not to say the music is bad, because it's not. I listened to all the Team 6 original songs on, on my holiday outside the game, and I actually enjoyed most of the tracks. They're just not fitting actually inside the games, but I'll talk about the music more in the further games. It's difficult to explain what I mean, but the game is only fun if you don't take it seriously. Enjoy sightseeing via cruising mode, unlockable by finishing the game or using a cheat. Enjoy trying to find the easter eggs. Enjoy messing around with the goofy physics, because the game's premise gets old, like, really quickly. Crazy Taxi is fun because you have to master the game's mechanics, try to get the highest score, or highest license, and even then the game's only enjoyable with short bursts. Taxi Racer London 2 gets boring too quickly, and it's not interesting enough to continue playing. The only reason to keep playing in my opinion is to unlock the cruising mode, but you can just cheat it in, so yeah. Here is why I'm supposed to review Thunderbolt 2, but thanks to its name, the only thing I can find are Macintosh compatible hard drives. So let's move on to Team 6's first racing game instead, Shanghai Street Racer. The first thing that we can notice is the weird spellings in the options have been fixed. Nice. We also have multiple game modes to choose from, and we have 10 maps, which look eerily similar. Hmm. We also have a couple of cars. They're all different from the last game, except for the Kenex set, which has different spelling this time. Although the car still has the logo purposefully attached, and the license plate says Kenex Z in the correct spelling. Which once again proves the theory that Blimp was supposed to have the Koenig Z license. You will also notice the price tags here, with the Koenig Z having a price of too much for you. Nice. But the prices don't actually matter, since you don't actually earn any money for each race. In fact, in a single race mode, all races are unlocked, which I don't hate, but it does remove any sort of reason to play the championships. In the first race, I picked the Koenig Z, which was completely unplayable due to the physics. Yeah, if I was Koenig Z, I would not want my car representing this game. I mean, not even the AI can handle the car, as they would crash around each corner, rather spectacularly too, since the cars weigh nothing in this game. Crashing into anything makes the car jump, slide and flip. Race number two, I picked the Beamer. It was only slightly easier to drive, but while the Seg would be too fast for its brakes, the BMW would brake in an instant, which I just couldn't get used to. With the third race, I realized there's only one map that you play on, so each race feels exactly the same to play. 
and what doesn't help are the constantly repeating textures. It overall feels like less of an indie attempt at building a city and more like an Android Unity cash grab, vine source style. And what, is this supposed to be Shanghai? It looks like New York! Team 6 wants to believe that they came up with the idea of this game before Angel Studios came up with Midnight Club. It's obvious that this game takes inspiration from Midnight Club too, with its 3D model characters next to the game's name, the setting looking similar to New York, which is a setting in the original game, and the point-to-point -point style of the racing without any barriers. And this might be a reach, but like how Midnight Club had a heavily Japanese influence, I think Team 6 wanted to take that, but change around a bit. Hence having Shanghai, China in the name, as opposed to having Wangan in Kanji like Midnight Club. The only thing I can say good about this game is the music, which is identical in style to Taxi Race London 2, and some songs are reasons too. But the music makes more sense here, and one of the tracks in this game I am in love with, which is the one you hear in the background. Again, this dark, mysterious type techno type of music outside this game is awesome, but in game it just adds to the crust, if that even makes sense, again. For the last game of the episode, we'll be looking at Taxi Raza. The back of the box states, speed through Berlin in your taxi, take passengers with you, I take them to sites all over the city. Look for people who are hidden VIPs like federal councillor and other famous politicians and personalities. Guaranteed driving fun from the makers of Audubon Raza. You know what's quite amusing about this? I got, in the case, I got a copy of Audubon Raza 3, which I actually do own already, so now I have two copies. What's weird though is that my copy is green and this copy is black and white. Oh. Anyway, let's start the game. You will see that the menu is in its transitional phase, between looking like the old menus and the newer ones. We can also see that each menu has a real-life picture from Germany, being very badly scaled down to 800 by 600 The credit screen is interesting as it shows Davlex and Team6, however no individual names are shown, sadly. On the main game screen, we have the classic option of choosing levels, however we finally have a cruising mode. Like I said in the review for Taxi Race in London 2, what makes the game fun is driving around the rich city so I'm glad that you can do this here too, without cheats. There is no way to choose a character, which is probably from the better, frankly. Unfortunately, this game was a headache to try to get up and running. On Windows 10, the game refused to launch, and likewise on Linux. I had to use a Windows XP virtual machine, and had to do it on my dad's computer, because the game requires CD authentication, and my laptop has no DVD drive. But this means I have to play in the lowest quality, to keep the game running smoothly under virtualization. As soon as I started playing, the music was the first thing that stood out to me. At first, I could hear some background music that sounded like Ingrid over background conversations. Wait, no, that is Ingrid. Huh. Anyway, as soon as I started driving, the music was fading in and out, and every street there was something different playing. I realized that this game has different songs based on the different parts of the city that you're in. A cool idea, however it was so badly coded and so abrupt, I thought it was VMware glitching out. Nope, that's just how it's meant to be. The fact each city sector is either music or background chatter is also weird. Like, am I meant to believe that the character keeps turning the radio on and off depending on where he is? Team 6 could have given the music reverb, so it at least sounds like it's blasting off people's windows or something. But it's a cool concept, and I do understand the intention of it. The suburbs having, say, classical music, and the main parts of the city having like trans and dance music makes sense. And speaking of the music, the dance parts of the city actually reuse music from London Racer. But not in a lazy recycling way, but in a quite a cute throwback way, using songs from Audubon Rise of Fall. There's also classical music, the world's most generic sounding rock music, and what I would describe as like Schlager singing? The game's files refer to this as true, however I'm not sure what that means. There's also an extra track that I haven't heard from. Have a listen. This really does sound like a real song, but I'm not sure what it's trying to copy, which is annoying. This, I think, is a Davlex track, though. I can hear the bootleg scoot in the background, but I'm not sure if this is from a game or if this, like, never made it into a game. I love it, though. This map is actually very well made. No longer do we have obvious photorealistic texturing, and no longer do the buildings look like cardboard boxes. There was actual work going to the 3D modelling of each building and each track, with them not being flat and having extrusion instead. The city has about the same level of depth as Taxi Race in London 2. Things are vaguely in the right place, but still feel off. There are times where you can drive for a long time from one side of the city to the other. The level design is basic enough that you can return to the Brandenburg Gate easily. But it has that sort of Davlex polish about it, mixed with the Team 6 big world design. The map is also usable in this game, showing you where potential customers are and where they want to be dropped off. 
The updated engine looks decent too. Once again, it's a mix of the old and new version of the engine, having updated lighting from the new engine, but a UI more reminiscent of the old one. This is probably the best use of photorealism, it's not in your face thanks to it working alongside the high quality 3D models. Sometimes it does go wrong though, like there being random buildings in the reflection of a car for example. Well, I have talked a lot so far and I haven't spoken about the gameplay. Well, the gameplay is exactly the same as Taxi Race in London too. The first major thing that is different is the fact that there is no different coloured currency, so you don't actually know how much you will earn before picking someone up. Secondly, the characters make more of an effort to actually get into your car the first time round, and doing so without just straight up clipping through your car. However, they do walk painfully slowly. The animations are fast moving now, and they actually look like people. Just like the cars look like cars. And you can push them with your car, which is a funny sight. When a pet gets into your car, they have a conversation. I am not sure as to what they say, maybe they're giving you directions or telling you if you're driving well, but what I do know is the character just goes, hmm, as a response, which is hilarious after a while. There is some gameplay variety. When you finish level, sometimes you unlock a car, or have to do a mission where you have to drive someone to a specific location. Is this supposed to be the political figure? You also pick up skateboarders, which actually stand by your car and use it to ride alongside you, which is pretty cool. And by alongside you, I mean they actually grab onto your car. Uh, yeah. There are power-ups that you can collect, of course. There are rockets, a barrier, turbo, repair, etc. Some things are useful, while others only exist as a bit of a joke. These power-ups are scattered throughout the maps on the streets, which means that you don't have to go out of your way to get them. Overall, being on Davlex's dime has really paid off here. This is the best game so far that I've played on this episode, and I'm not going to lie, it may be one of the best Team 6 games full stop, as it just gets worse from here on out. The game is not perfect and it isn't my favourite, as I prefer the London atmosphere, but the game is solidly made and I will likely revisit this game as it is a blast. The fact that just like Taxi Rest in London 2, there are things to do and things to explore makes this a game I recommend checking out, just like I recommend checking out Taxi Rest in London 2 if you're able to get your hands on those games. Thank you so much for watching this video. I am planning to do a second episode, however, I am really not sure when. I don't have a set deadline, but do subscribe if you would like to see episode 2 when it comes out. So, see you in the next one.